Welcome to you all watching from home or from the office or any other place you're currently at. Um, we're here at the Open Value Meetup. My name is Pak van Beckhoven and I will be your host for tonight. Um, tonight we will have two talks for you. Uh, the first one will start in a couple of minutes, then afterwards we'll have a short break and then followed by the second and last talk. Um, each session will take about 30 to 35 minutes and then we have some time for questions. If you have any questions, please ask them in the chat in, uh, on the YouTube channel. And then we will try to, I will relay the questions for you to our speaker. And then we'll let, yeah, let's continue with the actual speaker. So uh, our first speaker is Sander Mack. He's a Java champion and he's currently working at Picnic, which is an online supermarket, in which he will tell you more about. Uh, without further ado, um, let's start. All right. Thank you so much, Paco. And uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome to this talk. Thank you for joining me in this uh, adventure that we're going to go into with uh, scaling online groceries with Java. So my name is indeed uh, Sander Mark. I work with uh, Picnic as part of the tech leadership team. And uh, in this talk, I'm actually going to tell you the story of our challenges in the previous times. So online groceries are not exactly completely new, but as you'll see, um, things are taking on a different scale. Um, corona, of course, happens. And we'll see that it definitely has effect on us uh, as well. Um, but I mostly want to talk about how we scale our systems. And scaling, uh, to me, has two aspects. So on the, one time, on the one side, we have the runtime aspect of scalability. So I'm talking about uh, what we do to cope with our increasing customer base, increasing loads. Um, and that will be uh, the first thing that we look at after we look at the actual challenge, the online groceries challenge that we have as Picnic. Um, but even more important, I would say, is how, as a company, you can scale your Java development practices. So how can you ensure that even if your team grows, um, that you actually keep pace, that you will be able to implement uh, features quickly. Um, so these are the two aspects of scaling that we'll be talking about today. But before we go there, let's talk a little bit about what Picnic is and, and what we actually do. So bringing groceries to the, uh, to the home, um, isn't exactly new. You've probably all heard about this person, the milkman. Uh, I doubt that a lot of you have actually seen a real world uh, milkman. But if you go uh, back, I think about a century by now, um, then this was commonplace, right? You got your milk delivered to your home. In fact, in the 20s in the USA, about 70% of the milk was actually delivered to your home by this milkman. But as the years progressed, something changed. And by the 90s, about 0% of the milk was delivered at home. What happened? Well, supermarkets happened. So people actually got used to having everything in a single place, driving to the store, picking their own groceries, uh, having a huge assortment uh, to, uh, to choose from. And this is something that, uh, yeah, that displaced this single milkman who had a very interesting surface, but just couldn't cut it in the face of supermarkets. Now in the Netherlands, we also had a sort of a similar service, which was the uh, SRV service, where also someone was driving around with a very limited assortment in his, uh, in his uh, car, and you could uh, buy the groceries right in front, of your, uh, in front of your house. And well, again, the idea was pretty sympathetic. Um, it just couldn't cut it when you compare it to the breadth of the assortment at a supermarket. And um, again, also the SRV uh, truck disappeared from uh, the scene in the Netherlands. However, the milkman is back. So with Picnic, we strive to be the modern milkman. And we deliver groceries to your home. Uh, and it's not just milk, it's a wide range that any supermarket offers. And we do this uh, in a way where you only have to uh, use your phone. So we have a mobile app, mobile shopping app, where we have uh, the full supermarket assortments. You can pick and choose, place your order, and even the next day it will be delivered or whenever you want. We do this at supermarket prices, so this is not a premium offering. You don't have to pay for delivery, like in some, uh, some other circumstances. This is really something where we think uh, the convenience and uh, our, our offering will, uh, will bring much value. What is also really interesting is that we're in more ways than one, like the milkman that we just saw. Um, you cannot just pick an arbitrary time slot where we will arrive at your uh, uh, house. Our distribution model is such that we very efficiently go through neighborhoods and you have several options to choose from um, but we 
have sort of a milkman route that our electric vehicles drive. And in this way, we can together uh, uh, yeah, help you very efficiently in a very, uh, yeah, very quick manner. Uh, this makes our proposition uh, affordable. It makes it uh, pretty easy to do your weekly grocery shopping. Uh, and in the end, uh, this, uh, yeah, this, this really helps us to bring back the milkman uh, concepts, but in a modern way, in a, uh, in a way that uh, fits the 21st century. Now, to do this, obviously, we need a lot of software. So to, to give you a little taste of the kind of software that we built at Picnic, um, there's, of course, the app itself, which we built for iOS, Android, uh, also including a full backend. So this is uh, the backend uh, that we'll be talking about in terms of scaling uh, later as well. So everything on the shopping side is something that we build ourselves. Um, but it doesn't end there because we also do all of the fulfillment ourselves, meaning that we have warehouses where people pick the groceries, where we fulfill the orders that are placed through the app. Um, we're even in the process of building a fully automated warehouse in, uh, in Utrecht. And uh, this first automated warehouse uh, yeah, will be able to fulfill many more orders than the, uh, than the manual warehouses that we have. But as you can imagine, this also requires a lot of uh, software to be built. Then, once you have your order picked and everything is ready to go, now we need to plan your route. So we have these electric vehicles. And like I said, we want to make them uh, drive around in a very efficient manner. Uh, so also all the planning and distribution that's happening there, uh, we do with our own software. And then finally, there's also the customer service angle. So um, once you have your groceries, we hope that you're very happy, but things might not go as expected. So also around, everything that happens after your groceries are delivered. Um, yeah, we need a lot of software to handle that. And this is sort of the ecosystem that we as a tech team are currently building. And to give you an idea, uh, Picking itself is not at all yet. Um, it started about six years ago, but by now the uh, tech team consists of around 180 engineers. We're doing many, many releases of the software uh, products that I uh, mentioned earlier. So these 180 engineers are organized into around 20 product teams, which each built build a part of the, uh, the online groceries challenge that I uh, uh, just showed. Um, we're approaching 1 million customers over three different countries. We're active in the Netherlands, Germany, and France, and approaching around 4 million lines of code that we're building with this team. So as you can imagine, uh, we have quite some experience at, at this point with uh, scaling on both the access that I mentioned. So on the one hand, uh, scaling in terms of runtime load, but also scaling in terms of our development process. And this is what, uh, what we'll look at. And to start with the first one, um, COVID, Corona, however you want to call it, really hit us hard. Um, I think across the industry, a lot of uh, e-commerce actually had the same ex experience. Um, but what we saw is that our service overnight became essential with lockdowns. And here's a small graph that shows some of the traffic that we saw in these uh, early lockdown phases. And as you can see, um, we have some pretty interesting spikes of around 10 to 15 uh, times the amount of already pretty high traffic for us. And what was happening here is that um, on the one hand, we had a lot of people who were at home, couldn't leave their homes, and we had a lot of people who wanted to place their order with us. Uh, so every morning when new delivery slots were opened up and new capacity became available, uh, there was a sort of a uh, rush towards these, uh, these slots and people tried to get their groceries in. Now, of course, uh, this was not something that we anticipated from the get-go in terms of these kind of peaks and these kind of uh, uh, yeah, skill issues. But fortunately, uh, we were able to tackle them. And uh, yeah, I'd like to take you through a lot of uh, uh, some of the things that we, uh, that we learned and that we did to, to make it actually possible. So that brings us to the, uh, to the topic of scaling our Java systems. Now, six years ago, when Picnic started, um, it was a tiny tech team, right? It was a startup, just a few people, um, a, let's say, monolithic application that we call Picnic Platform, handled most of the concerns that I talked about. Um, and this was already Spring, uh, Spring Boot based and deployed to the cloud in Elastic Beanstalk. So a very high level managed environment by AWS. Um, at the same time, as the company grew, as we got more customers, as we knew more about what we were actually building as, as a uh, company, um, you saw that there were various off-the-shelf systems that we, uh, that we uh, used from the beginning, just to make, uh, make sure that we could get to the market quickly. 
uh, that started to become bottlenecks that were hard to actually scale. So what we did is um, we built a lot of these systems ourselves again uh, on a quite uh, similar uh, platform as we had uh, as we had earlier. Uh, meaning that uh, a lot of the uh, services that we first used off-the-shelf software for, like a warehouse management system and system to do uh, uh, to to do the distribution uh, with our runners, etc., uh, we build ourselves. This led to a landscape that uh, roughly looks like this, where there's still uh, this this original picnic platform uh, that we started with, but a lot of services have grown around that, uh, either spun out from this platform as independent products, an independent service or as something that replaced the uh, off-the-shelf software that we were using. Uh, we all built this uh, cloud first uh, in AWS uh, using for uh, some of the, uh, let's say, um, 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 services, some of the persistent services. We, we are using the Manage and Hostess vari uh, variants, uh, Amazon RDS, uh, MongoDB Atlas, for example, uh, as data storage, um, Cloud AMQP, so RabbitMQ for our messaging needs. Uh, which allows us to focus really on the development of our services, still using Spring, Spring Boot, uh, but now rolled out in, uh, in Kubernetes. And again, there we are using a managed service uh, from AWS, uh, the Elastic uh, Kubernetes service. And uh, this allows us to have these 20 product teams that I talked about, building their own products, building their own services, rolling them out, but also making it uh, scalable in a sense that we could also address the peaks that we saw before. Um, so we did learn a thing or two about auto-scaling and about the lag that there is in Kubernetes between detecting uh, new traffic and actually scaling up. So we also learned, learned a thing or two about uh, doing uh, scheduled scaling because some uh, of the traffic could be predicted by us uh, in advance. Uh, but this was only possible because we had this substrate, this Kubernetes plane uh, already in place with all of the services ready to scale there. Now, I think the takeaway here is that um, you don't do this from the get-go. Um, you always, I would say, start with a more monolithic and smaller approach using off-the-shelf software where possible. Uh, but once you have found your product market fit and you know where you're going, uh, that's the moment where you switch to a uh, strategy where you can build these in independent services. And uh, you do this uh, using a more, let's say, low-level stack, uh, so Kubernetes rather than Beanstalk, to be more in control in terms of scaling and in terms of uh, the actual rollout. Another thing that uh, really helped us to keep on top of uh, scaling and performance is making sure that you're actually running on uh, the latest stack. So what we did is um, once, for example, Java 11 became available as LTS release, uh, the quarter after that, we migrated all of our services to, to Java 11. And we plan to do the same thing again with the new LTS release that is coming up with Java 17. So this means you go through a cycle of uh, actually following along, but also upgrading your tools, your libraries, uh, using tools like JDAPs to find any issues with, with uh, APIs that might have changed, um, running your code first on 11 before you even start using some of the new features, which already gives you the new garbage collectors and uh, yeah, all the performance improvements that the new version of Java brings you. And, and ultimately, uh, of course, moving your builds and moving your uh, code base to Java 11 and then actually start using the language features and all the new goodies that come with this new version of Java. Now, in the case of uh, Java 8 to Java 11, there's quite a few changes and some of them are due to the module system, some are due to other deprecations that happened. Um, so in our case, uh, we did run into issues with, with missing libraries that were no longer in JDK. Um, but all in all, it was pretty manageable and pretty um, I would say, uh, doable. However, there are also some surprises every now and then if you upgrade your tech to the latest and greatest. For example, if you see a test case failure like this, where it says, I'm expecting 10 euros and I'm getting 10 euros, well, that looks okay, doesn't it? Um, actually, what happened here is that between Java 8 and Java 11, in the formatter for our locale, uh, a space was replaced by a non-breaking space, which is a different character, uh, but it looks the same on screen. So these are some uh, surprises that you might find if you have millions of lines of code that you're compiling on, on a new version of Java. And it can come from directions that you don't really uh, foresee. Uh, same things with deprecations and removals in the technology. These are all things that you can detect using uh, tools like JDAPs, as I mentioned before. Um, but again, uh, at scale, you will run into these kind of, uh, kind of issues when you keep up with the latest versions of, uh, of the tech. All in all, I would say, um, 
upgrading Java from 8 to 11 was, was um, not the biggest deal. Um, as I said, we are Spring-based. So moving, for example, from Spring 4 to Spring 5 was, was a much trickier migration because you have, a, at least from our perspective, a deeper integration with some of the details of, uh, of Spring. Um, and Spring, um, even though they do value backwards compatibility, um, yeah, does uh, a lot more changes between major versions than, uh, than a Java release typically does. So again, on the one hand, we had this, this platform where we deploy to, where we could scale. On the other hand, we were sure that we um, keep up with the technology that we use. Um, and in that sense, um, another thing that, uh, that came into our technology stack is also interesting. Because if you are going to this uh, well, Kubernetes stateless services, and just to deploy a lot of them uh, set up, you also want to make sure that you make the most effective use of the resources that you have. And one of the things that you see with the more traditional um, uh, Spring Web MVC approach is that um, at scale, um, you're not using resources as efficiently as possible. And this is where the reactive programming paradigm and the reactive stack of Spring comes in. And this is something that we, uh, that we started adopting within Picnic as well. First, we adopted ArcJava. Then once it became clear that Project Reactor was going to be the uh, reactive lib library of choice for Spring, um, we actually moved towards that. Um, and this, in the end, did bring us uh, increased, I would say, uh, better resource utilization. Um, but this is not going to be a sort of, uh, let's say, um, it's only singing the, singing the praises of uh, reactive programming. Because if you're adopting this kind of new technology, you will also find out some darker sides. Um, so on the plus side, moving to this reactive stack also encourages a more functional style of programming and more focus on immutability. And we'll talk a bit more about that uh, later as well, which I think is a big win in terms of uh, software engineering in general. But if you look at the practicalities of uh, working with uh, reactive programming, then there's also some downsides to it, which I think are not often enough talked about. So if you, for example, have this pretty plain piece of, of Java code where we say, okay, we have some repository, we're going to find a user, then we see whether the user is active, then we go to a different repository and get the roles for this user, and if not, then we get the default roles from this uh, repository. Um, this reads pretty intuitively, every Java developer knows what's going on here. If you're going to go in the reactive direction, where both your repository and your services are all using reactive types, um, then usually you see code like this, uh, which is more functional in style, like I said. So on the one hand, we still have the user repo, which now returns a reactive type, and then you can filter over that, say where the user is active, and then you need to transform the results from this uh, pipeline into the roles that you want to return. Um, if you look at the reactor API, for example, um, it's pretty huge, so the learning curve is quite steep. And it's also clear that the control structures that you have in your regular Java codes are actually flattened into this reactive stream pipeline that we see here. And this takes a bit of getting used to, and I'm not 100% sure if it's actually an improvement, at least from the readability perspective. In fact, um, you could even ask the question, are these two completely equivalent? And there's actually, if you look pretty closely, a scenario where uh, the behavior of this reactive code is different than the plain code on the, on the left hand side that you see here. The point um, is that even though reactive helped us to make better use of resources, it came at the cost of having code that is less intuitive, of having to train developers in this reactive library, which is pretty, pretty steep in terms of a learning curve, with things like uh, scheduling and then subscription time versus construction time of your reactive pipelines. Um, so yes, important technology in terms of scaling, uh, but also with some pain points. Another pain point here is that if you are going to debug reactive code, you're in for a treat. You will get stack traces that are, let's say, pretty non-descriptive in terms of what the actual business code underneath is doing, because it is fully intertwined with the uh, structure and the assembly of your stream pipeline and everything that happens in the uh, reactive world. Fortunately, there are some tools here to help you. If you're using Spring Reactor, I highly recommend you check out the uh, Reactor Debug Agents that they also um, uh, provide, which make this uh, a bit more palatable, a bit more uh, readable. Uh, it's still not a walk in the park to, uh, to debug these uh, stack traces, 
but it's really uh, something that, uh, that helps you. Another thing is that if you're moving to this more, well, I wouldn't say really cutting edge, but still pretty uh, recent technology, you will also find out that integration with tooling uh, is somewhat lacking. So we, for example, use New Relic to actually keep track of our performance, doing monitoring and observability. And New Relic has some pretty nice integrations for Spring Web MVC, where you see all the routes, etc. Um, and at some point, if you move to Spring Map Flux and Reactive, you lose a lot of this. And of course, at some point, New Relic and their Java agents actually caught up to this. Um, but then again, this is one of the downsides of going with a technology that is not as mature yet. So it helped the scale, but it also gave us uh, a little bit more headaches than we would have hoped in terms of uh, technology and integration with other tools. Last, um, what you will also find out if you're moving towards a more reactive stack is that yes, um, if you're in a perfect world, it will help you to make better use of resources, do things in an asynchronous manner, but you're most likely not end-to-end -end reactive anyway. So if you still are stuck with a database driver that is not reactive or you are stuck with a library that does blocking HTTP calls, or you're doing file, file or other or integrations with code that isn't really suited yet to the uh, reactive pipeline, um, then there are ways around this. I mean, um, you can definitely use different schedulers and do subscribe-ons, etc., in, in your reactive code. But again, this is an added layer of complexity, and this is something that uh, doesn't come natural um, if you're not familiar with, with the reactive stack and with the reactive APIs. And you will run into this. I mean, um, I have not seen yet a completely uh, an application that can completely shun any blocking calls. So again, here there are some tools to help you. Um, Reactor also offers Blockhound, which is sort of a detection tool that you can run alongside your application, which will tell you if you are doing blocking operations on these reactive. Uh, uh, pipelines and if so it can either warn you or give you an error and uh, depending on how you configure it so that will help you to actually find the pain points and isolate them put them on different schedulers and that way uh, also make sure that you uh, yeah, that you uh, do this correctly but this is something that uh, that will take some time that will take some uh, efforts uh, for developers to to actually uh, lean into now i think there's some pretty interesting developments going on in the java space uh, one of them is uh, Project Loom, where we will get lightweight threads or fibers and continuations, which promise us to uh, allow us to have a normal, uh, let's say, uh, Java uh, coding style, where we can just do blocking calls and don't have to wrap them and don't have to do asynchronous APIs explicitly, but where Project Loom under the hood will transform this into a continuation style, non-blocking uh, kind of execution. Now, this would be great because it would give us the best of both worlds. We would keep our simple and relatively straightforward um, uh, sequential and blocking codes, but at the same time, it will execute in a non-blocking and asynchronous way. However, this will not make Java 17, uh, so it will not be in the next LTS. So it remains to be seen when this is actually delivered and when we will be able to use this as a Java community. I think um, when this lands, it will definitely, hopefully, spark a real and uh, necessary discussion on uh, whether we want to go the reactive route or whether we want to go a more, let's say, uh, traditional route in terms of APIs, but have Project Loom uh, do the efficient resource uh, scheduling for us. But I guess we'll find out. So that's about the runtime aspect and the technology aspects of, of scaling and the systems themselves. I also want to touch upon our tooling and what we do there to actually make sure that this team of 180 developers can efficiently develop uh, these services and these applications. So what happens when teams grow and they start churning more out more and more software? Well, fortunately, we do have a code review process within Picnic and we have always had that. Um, but if you don't watch out, then this quickly devolves into bike shedding, right? About formatting around, do we use optional or not? Tap for spaces, please put your JIRA number in the commits. There's a lot of things that are pretty important and that are pretty nice to do uniformly. And that's up to a point you can do with like team discipline and just being able to 
see each other and talk to each other and being in the same room. Um, but if you grow, and if you grow as quickly as Picnic does, and at some point that doesn't work anymore, and you don't want to pollute your code review process and everything uh, with these kind of trivial concerns. So what do you do? Well, you try to automate all the things so that you can focus on what really matters. And I want to share some of the things and the tools that we did there to, to make this uh, make this. So on the one hand, um, we have our CI builds that builds every PR uh, that we have in GitHub. And a tool that is pretty interesting there uh, that you should definitely check out um, to automate some of the checks that I talked about is, is Danger. And this is part of our CI and our PR process. And for example, um, I mentioned that we find it very important to have, for example, the JIRA uh, ticket code as part of the commit measures. Um, we can easily, using this uh, Ruby DSL offered by Danger, write this quick, uh, uh, quick script that on each commit to the PR checks whether the commit message actually starts with a, uh, with a uh, uh, JIRA pattern. And if it doesn't, well, then uh, this bot that is running uh, the danger code will actually post to the PR. Um, please make sure that your commit message adheres to the thing that we agree to. So that's one example of what you can do with uh, with tooling around GitHub and around the PRs. Now, another interesting one, uh, which I personally find very uh, very nice, and uh, that we also wrote using the same tooling. Uh, what we do pretty religiously is in our code comments reference tickets when there's additional work to do. So we don't just say to do, but we say, okay, to do this ticket needs to be fixed and needs to be fixing this part of the code. So once someone opens a PR for that particular pick, a ticket, uh, it is imperative that you find all the references to this, uh, to this ticket in your code. And, oh, sorry. And again, um, uh, Danger helps here to using, uh, using this Ruby DSL to go through your re repos uh, to find all comments that actually are pertaining to this particular uh, ticket in your PR. And it will post comments telling you, okay, please fix all uh, the references that you have not uh, addressed yet. Uh, not just in the current repository, but also in other repositories. So it gives you a very nice, uh, nice process there. Now, the other thing that I mentioned in the uh, PR uh, review process is uh, style formatting. And uh, Besides the tabs versus bases, there's lots of uh, discussion that you can have around uh, Java code formatting, but I would say life's too short to have the discussion. Just pick some style and stick with it. So this is something that we uh, do using the Google Java format uh, tool. This is something that is enabled, uh, that you can enable in, uh, in your RDE, of course, but we also enable this uh, on our CI system, which means that on the CI, uh, we run a format script, with all, which also runs the uh, Java formatting tool. And it's pretty simple. If this leads to any diff, so after running the formatter, if there's any diff at that point uh, in, the, in the Git uh, repository, uh, then you cannot, you cannot merge that PR. Uh, we will just block it. Um, so what most developers do is just also run the script as a uh, post commit hook on their uh, local systems. It doesn't really matter how you do it. It's just that we, um, Stick, stick with a particular style and we enforce it. And um, I think another language that does this already natively, like Go, has proven that this takes, uh, takes away a lot of uh, discussions, lots of uh, useless discussions. And if you will make any changes um, to this code style, that's possible, but you will have to reformat all of your code and you will have to make sure that it's all up to speed and all in the same style again, uh, which is not something that you do uh, trivially. So again, these discussions are, uh, are uh, parked. Now, this means that if you have any code that does not adhere to the uh, Google uh, AOSP um, uh, style formatting, again, you will not be able to merge your PR. You will get a comment from this uh, picnic bot uh, telling you that you will have to format your code before you go on. Now, another thing uh, that has really helped us to keep uh, keep our place tidy, let's say, and keep our, in this case, our dependencies upgraded is uh, the Renovate uh, tool, Renovate bus. Again, this is something that you can run uh, against your repositories in GitHub, and it will automatically, in our case, check the POM files, see if there's any outdated dependencies, and if so, automatically already open a PR with an upgrade. Uh, as you can see, also suggesting already a commit message in our particular style that we want for these uh, dependency upgrades. 
This way it makes it very easy to keep track and to keep up to date with, uh, with the latest dependencies in your, uh, in your system. So these were all things uh, that previously were more or less manual. Uh, but at scale, you really want to automate this and want to take this out of the hands of uh, people and uh, yeah, make, it, make it so easy that you can miss it, that you cannot uh, actually forget about it and that you will stay up to date. Another tool that we use um, that is, uh, I think, very interesting and uh, somewhat underrated is uh, error prone. And error prone is a tool that you can use to detect Java bugs or enter patterns in your code. It's a bit like uh, spot bugs or that kind of uh, tooling. But the interesting thing is that it's written as a actual Java compiler plugin. Um, it also allows you to write your own additional checks. Um, and we'll see that it doesn't just do checking, but it can also do automatic patching uh, of code. And that opens up some very interesting capabilities. But first of all, error prone as a detection tool. So there's a lot of uh, predefined um, anti-patterns that it scans for already that, uh, that you get out of the box if you use uh, error prone on your code base. And um, it's interesting because uh, they even found some bugs in the concurrent hash map implementation from Doug Lee. So he says, well, it's uh, definitely embarrassing. I guess I'm back to liking error prone, even though it sometimes annoys me, which is, I think, a uh, very, uh, very high praise for such a tool coming from, uh, from Doug Lee. Now, I want to show quickly what this looks like in practice. So I have a very simple Java class here, uh, public static for the main, and I instantiate a argument, uh, an illegal argument exception, but I don't actually throw it, right? So usually this is uh, not what you would want in Java code. Um, and just to give you an idea, um, let's see, I can quickly insert some code here. Yeah, EP config. What I can do is I can uh, configure error prone as a compiler plugin on the uh, Maven compiler plugin. I also have to uh, define that we want a simple compile policy because it does make some assumptions on your Java AST uh, during compilation, which we can enforce by setting this flag. Uh, of course, uh, there's also the uh, annotation processor uh, path that we need to set. And if I actually run this on, let's see, even clean verify, we go. If I run this on the code that you just saw, you will see that it actually gives a compilation failure. So it's not some kind of post-processing step. It's actually the compiler now telling me that through this error prone plugin uh, that I have a dead exception. It's created, but it's not uh, thrown. Now that in itself is not that shocking yet, but what I think is really cool about error prone is that we can also um, configure it not to just detect errors, but also to patch them. And this doesn't work for all of the checks, um, but for some of them, it's, it's actually possible to say, okay, um, check, for example, these dead exception uh, uh, errors and patch them in this case in place. You can also do it uh, in, in, uh, output it into a different source tree. But if I now run the same command, rather than giving a compile error, it actually changes the code for me and uh, changes it into throw new legal exception. Now, this is something that you can pretty easily uh, use with the same trick that we saw before with the formatting. So in your CI pipeline, just run all of the, these patches on your codes. And if there's any diff, then apparently, well, you'd, uh, you haven't uh, satisfied all the checks. But I think there's an even uh, cooler application of this uh, as well. Then there's uh, the ability to actually refactor your code at scale. So the capabilities of rewriting codes or error prone are based on a tool that is part of this error prone tool suite called Refaster. And the cool thing about Refaster is that it allows you to also write your own templates saying, okay, I have some kind of before code and some kind of after code. You can compile this into a Refaster template, which is here the my, my template that Refaster. Um, you also provide your own source codes. And then as we saw the error prone uh, compiler plugin together with this patch uh, instruction that we gave can actually output patched source code and doing large-scale refactorings that way is possible. So to give you an idea of the kind of patterns that you can write, um, it's not really scary. You don't have to do any AST manipulation. You can just write um, concrete Java syntax. And you can see in the before template here that we say, okay, on an expression of type optional, if you see something that looks like uh, uh, not 
optional is present, then what we would like to do is that as of Java 11, we want to rewrite this to optional dot is empty. And again, this um, um, optional is empty class, we can comp compile this into a refactor template and we can use this together with the error prone plugin to do automated refactoring. Just to give you another taste, um, you can also match multiple patterns using refactor any of in the before. And uh, again, this is something that you might want to do if you move to Java 11. Find any stream pipelines where your first filter on optional is present and then map optional uh, get. Uh, you can change this to a flat map of optional stream in Java 11. So there's many more things that you could do here. And this is something that, uh, that helps us to, at a large scale, uh, apply refactorings and apply best practices in our code base. And again, like I said, we can integrate this with the danger tooling that we just saw to ensure that this always runs in every, uh, every build uh, so that we know that all of these checks and all of these refactorings are applied. One other thing um, that is pretty important when developing uh, at scale is that you have code that is easy to reason about. And one of the things uh, that you can also do with error prone here is um, turn things around a little bit. Because in Java, by default, parameters, variables are non-final. So to really make them non-reassignable, you would have to make all of them final, which gives you some benefits, but also some visual noise. And what you can do with error prone is you can invert this and say, okay, we're going to assume that every variable that we compile is final and only in the exceptions where we know that we want to reassign, like with this found variable, uh, we put in the advar annotation and then we're allowed to reassign to this variable. But in any other case, um, everything will be uh, considered final. That's, uh, that's another trick in, in the toolbox that uh, error prone offers us. Now talking about immutability, um, final of course, gives you a little bit of increased, uh, let's say, um, uh, confidence in your code. But as we know, uh, there's still a lot of other mutable states that you still can have in your Java objects. Um, so that's why we also really value modeling our data classes, our entity classes, using uh, a library called immutables. Uh, immutables is a bit similar to, for example, what you can do with data classes in Kotlin or with uh, Lombok. Um, the nice thing about immutables is that it's implemented as an actual uh, legit annotation processor that generates the immutable code for you, rather than hacking into the Java compiler like with uh, Lombok. Um, and what you can do is you can actually write a Java interface or another abstract type, uh, put on some annotations to guide the actual translation into an immutable class, and then the immutables annotation processor turns this abstract type into a concrete immutable class that you can start using in your application. And this will give you a sane implementation for equals, hash code into string. It will give you a builder to work with, uh, with copy methods to easily change an immutable instance into another immutable instance with a different value for a certain fields. Uh, you can do lazy population of fields. You can do precondition checking. There's a very nice integration with, uh, with Grava, which we also use. So all in all, um, ticks a lot of the boxes for us in terms of uh, yeah, making code more readable and, and more uh, reliable. Um, I'm not going to do a full demo, but I just want to quickly show you what this looks like in practice. So um, in this case, in this example, the product class here is a generated type, as you can see, uh, generated by the annotation processor that comes with immutables. And it is built, it is generated based on this interface where we say, okay, uh, anything that starts with i uh, star, we will translate into uh, something without the i. So i product becomes a product. And it has the properties uh, get name, get brand, get price. We want to uh, also create a factory method where we can just pass in all the parameters if we want to. There's a lot of options that you get and that you can steer through these uh, at value uh, dot immutable and value style um, annotations. And in the end, what this gives us is a, a very easy way to work with immutable data. We can also say, for example, products off and then just provide the parameters to get another instance. It also integrates pretty nicely with, uh, with Jackson for uh, doing uh, serialization and deserialization into JSON for APIs. So all in all, a very nice tool to, to have in your toolbox as a Java developer. And let me quickly move back to wrap up. Um, 
Again, similar to with the reactive uh, stack, there's also upcoming changes in Java that are along the same lines. So we get records in, uh, in the new version of, of Java, which are similar. Um, they also give you a concise way of defining these data-only classes, generating a constructor for you, accessor methods equals hash code to string, etc. Um, so most likely, uh, at least part of a use case can start using records rather than immu immutables. Um, won't go into too many details, but there's of course a lot of things that you can steer and do with this immutable annotation processor that you cannot do with records. So there's always um, yeah, special use cases. But in general, it seems that the Java language is also moving more towards the direction of immutability. And I think that's again a good thing. So to wrap this up, um, scaling online groceries with Java. So on the one hand, this has to do with uh, the actual deployment stack that you choose, the technologies that you want to keep up with. So yes, choose your technology wisely um, and aggressively keep up. So one of the things that we learned is that by uh, keeping up on our technology, we were able to incrementally also get performance improvements, for example, with new versions of Java. Uh, and uh, we also get access to newer paradigms like reactive programming, even though it comes with its own downsides. And then as a second takeaway, in terms of scaling your development process, um, try to automate all of the boring parts away. And this can go pretty far, as you can saw, as you could see, this is not just about formatting, but this is going, can, can go pretty deeply into what you can do with refaster and error prone in terms of large scale uh, pattern matching and replacement of codes. So again, uh, critically look at what you're currently doing in terms of your process and yeah, cut out all of the trivial stuff, cut out all of the, let's say, um, style related stuff, just make a choice and make sure that it's adhered to and enforced in a, in a general manner and you will be much, much happier, I promise. So that is it. Um, I hope that you liked what you saw. Uh, if so, you're uh, welcome to go to join.picnic.app because we need a lot more people to help us build uh, the technology behind Picnic. Be happy to talk to you. Um, but for now, um, are there any questions for me? Yes. Well, uh, thank you, Sander. Uh, it was a really interesting talk. I especially loved the, the part about the, let's say, the enforcing all the rules for the development process. Uh, I really like it. Um, we already actually got some questions, uh, so I'll just uh, read them for you. Mm -hmm. um, the first one is about the, re the changes by reactive programming. So, mm -hmm. um, do you have concrete examples of, um, of the benefits that you have achieved so far? For example, faster response times or less servers? Yeah, so um, just to give a picture, um, we have a few services that are, let's say, fully reactive, so that they're buying into the whole Webflux stack and uh, uh, also using reactive Mongo drivers, etc. What we see there is that the, the latency uh, is definitely um, lower than with the traditional Spring uh, WebMVC stack that we had. Um, it is hard to really uh, compare apples to apples there because we don't have two services doing the same thing with two different technology stacks. Uh, but in that sense, uh, we do see a reduction in latency. Um, if you look at the uh, provisioning that we do for, uh, for these kind of services in Kubernetes, in general, I would say that we can be more conservative with the, uh, with the, with the provisioning for these uh, reactive services than with the uh, non-reactive services. Although again, yeah, it's not quite an apples to apples comparison because well, there are still different services doing different things just with different uh, technology stack. Um, but yeah, I, I think uh, especially for some of the services that's migrated so that we're not completely uh, built from scratch, uh, we did on the latency side see improvements there. Yeah. Okay, well that, that's at least nice uh, there. Mm -hmm. um, related, also related to this, um, what percentage of your code page has code base has already been migrated? Did you pick specific areas or did you just go all the way? Um, definitely not all the way. Um, I would say that a good 60 to 70 percent of our codes is at least using some uh, part of the, uh, the reactive stack. Um, what we have is we have a few uh, services that we know that we're going to phase out, that we know that we're going to replace at some point, so we're not going to migrate those. Um, but most of the new services that we are building are using Webflux and are using the, the full reactive stack. Um, 
this is something that we can do now because we went through this sort of learning curve and we have the tools in place, etc., etc. So uh, it becomes easier, but uh, uh, I won't lie, it was definitely uh, a bumpy ride to get there. Yeah. Yeah, and you also mentioned it comes at some cost, uh, like for example the readability. Mm -hmm. Do you also fully utilize this reactive, uh, say this reactive stack from back to front, like you say you mentioned for example database drivers, but mm -hmm. there's also all the way to the actual apps of the users. Is mm -hmm. that completely reactive from? Um, so when you talk about to the apps, you're probably thinking about things like R sockets or these kind of reactive integrations. And that is not yet the case. So uh, our, our apps are uh, just plain HTTP and JSON integration. Um, but most of these backend services that are built using the WebSock stack do use end-to-end -end reactivity. And uh, what is interesting is that there's the uh, the reactive JDBC drivers are becoming more and more mature. So we've uh, in, uh, in some of our services started adopting those. Um, and on the Mongo side, for a longer time, there were already reactive drivers. So for the services that were uh, solely re relying on Mongo, it was already a while ago uh, possible to, to do this uh, transition. Yeah. Cool, nice. Um, this is about the, the development uh, process and uh, how you enforce this. Mm -hmm. uh, one, example that you, one of the examples you gave was the, the picnic bot. Mm -hmm. um, doesn't auto-updating dependencies lead to breaking code slash functionality? Or do you have enough automated tests to be sure that that doesn't happen? Uh, yes, there's always the risk that if you upgrade the dependency that uh, behavior changes. Um, I would say indeed that, that testing um, is, is the thing that you want to have in place before you do this. Uh, you can just uh, shove this through production and hope for the best. Um, but at the same time, if you do this very frequently, uh, then the deltas between these versions are relatively small and you pretty quickly find out if there are any issues. Uh, so, so far, I think it's it's in that benefit uh, rather than a something that is a, is a liability. Um, yeah, if you do this manually, um, then you make bigger steps and you have more changes and more risk uh, to, to tackle at the same time. Yeah, with some inside knowledge, I, I know that for each upgrade you actually open a PR which also needs to be approved. So people yeah. actually look at it, they will go over for the sure. release notes yeah. before they approve yeah. it. So that I guess also will help a lot in this process. True. Yeah. Um, and if there are any breaking changes in the API, then well, the PR won't compile, so you will have to fix that first. So exactly. there are things in place to, to prevent. And that or actually already happens because the pull request was opened yeah. and the build broke. So you immediately know this is an yeah. easy one or a hard one. And the interesting thing is that we don't just do this for external dependencies, but also for dependencies between uh, some of our projects. So also for internal artifacts. Yeah. Um, you, uh, in one of the earlier slides, you have a, had an example of the procedural and uh, reactive code for the user info service. Mm -hmm. um, um, that they are not functionally equivalent, but what was the exact difference between them talking about the functionality? Let's try to go back here. Right. Um, so what happens, for example, if there's no user, if you can't find a user here? This sort of error behavior it can be different in these, uh, these pipelines. So I would say in the uh, original code, it would be probably some kind of uh, exception uh, term. Uh, in the pipeline, it would probably emit an empty mono or empty flux, and then you would eventually read, uh, reach the switch of empty and then just return the default roles, for example. Um, yeah, these are things that are not completely apparent when you when you make these kind of pipelines and yeah. this kind of switch. Yeah. Also part of the, the steep learning curve, I guess, of yeah. this new yeah, for sure. version. Yeah. Okay, um, there's more, of course. Uh, I'll just do a couple more. Mm -hmm. um, so do you use Java only, or do you also use other GVM languages in the Picnic stack. Um, so for our backend services, uh, we are exclusively using Java, but for uh, the front-end app, um, we also use Kotlin. I think uh, there's uh, an increasing amount of services that are written in Python uh, as well uh, at, uh, at Picnic. Um, so yeah, there's, there's as the team grows, also different preferences uh, growing, of course. Uh, 
But the nice thing about this relatively uniform stack that we have at Java is all the tooling that we have around it, like for example with Aeropron and then Refaster, exactly. um, which makes it very enticing to to stick to the stack and uh, to actually uh, yeah, implement it that way. Nice. Um, about the, can you elaborate on your use of Quarkus? For instance, do you use native images? I'm not sure if I mentioned Quarkus yeah, in our use of it, because um, we don't. Okay, well, that's a <laughs> yeah, quick no. answer then. Um, here is the, another one about the development process. So, uh, who improves your developer story? Do you have a couple of motivated individuals, or is it a team effort? Uh, great question. So, um, it's a bit of both. So, we have a platform team who is uh, really active in, in developing this uh, kind of shared tooling. Uh, but there's a lot of people, a lot of people from the product teams as well who contribute and who have ideas and who can uh, create pull requests on these tools as well. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's also nice. Um, given the time, uh, I think that's it. Mm -hmm. uh, you can, I think you can also be reached on Twitter. So if people have extra yeah. questions, they can just reach out to you. Indeed, uh, at uh, Sander underscore Mark uh, on Twitter. So, yeah, yeah. so on the slides. feel free to uh, send him another uh, tweet if you have more questions. Um, we'll have a short break and we'll be back uh, again at 8. And uh, of course, sorry, uh, thanks. <laughs> yeah. Thank you.
Hello and welcome back to the second uh, talk of uh, this meetup. The second session I will be joined by two of my colleagues, uh, Bertjan and Jago, which will be going head to head on uh, in a battle between Spring Boot and Quarkus. Um, that's actually that's all I have to say for this. Um, give them a small silent round of applause from behind your keyboard and uh, here's the floor to uh, Jago and Bertjan. Good luck. Thank you for the applause behind the keyboard. Welcome to a head-to-head -head battle between Spring Boot and Bark and Squarkus. We all know it's going to win, uh, right? Uh, my name is Bertjan Schrijver, and I love Spring Boot. And I'm joined here by Jago. Yeah, my name is Jago de Brede, and uh, well, I of course uh, love Quarkus. Uh, Quarkus is a little bit like uh, Spring Boot, only the, the big difference is that it's based on uh, Java EE technology. So uh, you can uh, still use your uh, enterprise skills uh, with uh, microservices. So that's kind of cool. So what are we going to build? Yes, we're going to do a head-to-head -head battle by building an example application. So we need something that's kind of um, responsible for and respectable for what, what daily things we do as developers so probably we need to do something with rest maybe a service and a client we need to do something with a database uh, stuff like this so let's start with um, the beginning we're going to expose a rest api to uh, clients um, this rest api needs to get data from a database so we're going to use a repository that um, serves as a facade to connect to the database um, we're going to need some data to get a database so we're going to call the coin market cap api which provides us with exchange rates for various cryptocurrencies. We're going to build a REST client that is going to talk to this API and to tie everything together. We have a service and the service is going to basically serve as a facade for the REST API to expose calls to the REST client and to the repository to return stuff from our database. So we are going to our favorite place on the internet, start.spring.io make a few clicks, uh, press enter, download the zip file, and then we are greeted with a out-of-the-box working amazing Spring application. Uh, so it kind of looks like this. Uh, you have your tests already. There's a, um, an app a Spring application that will start everything up. Uh, and from then on, we're ready to get going and build microservices. So we'll start with our uh, controller, the REST controller. If you are familiar to working with Spring, uh, this is fairly easy, right? So we have a couple of uh, endpoints one that uh, returns all cryptocurrencies in the system, one that re returns a specific one. We have one to clear the database and we have an endpoint to update stuff from the database. So all this basically is, is an annotation with the um, uh, REST API part. Uh, there's a method and there's a call that delegates to the service. It's, it's easy, it's basically child's play. Everyone uh, can do it if you're familiar with how this works in Spring. So we need some configuration to um, connect to the database. This is only a few lines of configuration. We're going to connect to a local Postgres database. We have a username, password, uh, that's it. And we have some configuration keys we're going to use later to connect to the API. All this in just a few lines of code. Beautiful, simple, and easy. So if we call the uh, CoinMarketCap API, we are greeted with this response. So we get a, an object that has a status object, so JSON with a status object, and there's a data array in there, and this data array basically contains an array of uh, cryptocurrency information. So there's um, one entry in the example for Bitcoin. It has a name, a symbol, and a slug, which is a short, short name. Um, and we're going to basically iterate over this array and populate our database uh, with this. 
So, Iago is going to uh, perform a uh, live demo trapeze act uh, now. So, what could go wrong if we do this with Quarkus? What could go wrong? Yeah, of course. So, let's first head over to the uh, Quarkus website because, like you mentioned, uh, Spring has a nice uh, starter uh, website. Well, Quarkus has the same thing. So, uh, let's get started. Well, what you first need is an IDE, blah, blah, uh, Maven, and uh, well, uh, let's get uh, start coding. So, first off, uh, let's uh, populate the group uh, and uh, let's create the artifacts. Uh, let's call it crypto rates. Uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to do uh, a REST endpoint. So, we're going to use REST Easy uh, with, uh, with Jackson. Uh, we're going to do some uh, database uh, stuff. So, let's uh, at Hibernate with Pinash. Pinash is uh, the, the data layer for uh, Quarkus that's comparable to the, to the Spring one. Uh, let's have a uh, Swagger API, so that's in uh, the Open API. So let's add that. Uh, and of course, Hibernate uh, needs to communicate with, uh, with the database, which was a Postgres SQL uh, DWC driver. Great, uh, I think we uh, we have it. For me, as a as a Spring guy, that does look awfully familiar, Iago. Yeah, this is absolutely the same. So, oh, uh, and we're of course gonna call a uh, REST uh, uh, REST client. So we're gonna actually call the uh, Core Market Gap API. So let's uh, add the REST client with uh, with Jackson and download the zip, extract the zip. And let's open uh, IntelliJ. And let's see what's inside of that uh, zip we just extracted. So we are greeted by a, a README, which is uh, quite uh, comprehensive. All kinds of uh, neat uh, little, little things in there on uh, how to get started. Uh, and what's inside of the uh, the application, we have a greeting resource, that's our REST uh, endpoints. Uh, we do have some tests, well, not going to need tests because we're excellent developers. You don't need tests uh, with Quarkus? Absolutely not. No, <laughs> that's, that's, that's for lame ass for later. <laughs> so as you can see, we only have a greeting resource here and this should work now. So let's head over to the terminal and let's, uh, oh no, no. We first need to uh, configure the application, of course. Um, first, we need to configure the, uh, the console because we are uh, presenting in light mode and Quarkus was made for the dark mode. So we need to uh, darken the log uh, to the console, otherwise it won't be readable. But hey, this is only a, uh, a thing for the light mode uh, that's uh, being annoyed. Uh, and of course, we need to uh, uh, make the format of the console a little bit smaller uh, so we can uh, read it uh, in uh, presentation mode. But this should is, uh, should be done in, uh, in real life. And uh, of course we need uh, the database, uh, which almost looks the same thing as uh, what you, you had, yeah. only now it's prefixed with Quarkus and instead of Spring, right? It's almost the same. Yeah. So this should be now enough to uh, run the application. So let's see if I can open the terminal which is really hard to do from inside of the uh, presentation mode. So here we can just call Quarkus Dev. And now the application will start up. And there we are. Uh, Quarkus has a nice uh, dev console, so uh, we can uh, open the dev console in uh, our Chrome uh, browser. And here we have a uh, dev console for, uh, for Quarkus. Uh, we can just uh, head over to, uh, to our Swagger API and just try this out. And hey, we have a uh, hello rest easy. What was just in here? So, but this is not what we want. We want to return a list of uh, cryptocurrencies. So let's start off with a empty list. With an empty list of, of course, 
objects for now. This, uh, this should be enough. Uh, you had it on uh, the root path, and this one was called uh, with a path of all, I believe. So now it should be the same as uh, what you had. So if we refresh Swagger, we now have a all endpoint. And let's try that one out, and we have a empty array. So that's kind of cool. So this was it for a rest endpoint. So how do you do? Spring Boot or Quarks? What was the major difference? Spring had one uh, annotation for the get resource. I had to do two. I had to have a, a get and a uh, just and, and, get a path. You. <laughs> and a path. Uh, but that's it. So they look quite similar, right? Yeah, I'd say it's a, it's a tie because what the, the, the dev console was nice, uh, but apart from that, uh, the, the experience of generating project the rest endpoints they all look very the same. So I'd say we're tied so far. Yeah, absolutely. But I went next. So so what did you do with the uh, API then? Yeah, so we need to call the coin market cap API, which is basically a get uh, get uh, request. Uh, we need to feed an API key as an HTTP header in the REST client, and then we get uh, as a result we get the um, uh, the format that we already showed before. So let's build this uh, um, API client. So we're uh, injecting two configuration keys, the API key and the URL to the CoinMarketCap API. And then we're going to build a map of the URL parameters we're going to feed into the request. Uh, then we're going to um, create an HTTP headers object where we need to inject the uh, API key. Uh, and then we call a REST template that will perform an HTTP exchange. So we're going to call the API URL, we're going to do a GET and we uh, are going to send the parameters and the headers and we map the response to the uh, coin market cap response and we return the body of this response so the coin market cap response basically is uh, the maps to the data field in the json response and uh, over there we map this to a list of uh, our, our cryptocurrency object which basically represents one item in the response so over here we have an ID, a name, a symbol, and a slug. But we're mainly only going to look at the, the name and the symbol for the sake of the, uh, the demo. Uh, so that's it. One simple call mapped to, an, uh, to a small entity, and then we're ready to, uh, to do something with the REST uh, client. So how does it look in Quarkus? Let's see. Well, I think Will it be as easy as it was in Spring? I think there's way too much code there. So let's, let's try and improve that. I got to give it to you, it was a bit verbose. The map for the headers... Uh, yeah. On the HTTP headers, the map for the parameters, uh, it was a couple of lines of code for a REST call. On the other hand, it was, it was not a trivial call, right? You need to add a header, you need to have parameters, you need to map it to something. So I think it was pretty, pretty okay. Yeah, okay. So let's see. Uh, let's copy and paste your uh, piece of code. Uh, I love that you said piece of code and not that other word that you would expect no. when you're saying piece of. <laughs> so what I copy pasted was the cryptocurrency entity. Uh, without the entity class, because we're just uh, uh, gonna do the the rest uh, call for now, and we have the core market cap yeah. response object that that you uh, created. Well, I got a nice ID upgrade, uh, which I'll do later. So let's create a REST client in uh, in Quarkus then. So let's create a uh, it's called coin market cap uh, clients or something like that. So, first off, this is not a class, this will be an interface. So we can register this as a REST client. So, and of course we need to uh, tell uh, Quarkus which, uh, which REST client it should be, otherwise it would be very verbose, it would be the class name, so that's really annoying. So let's uh, create a config key, uh, and head over to the configuration, and you had something with... Uh, an API key and a uh, REST endpoint. So <laughs> we probably need to revoke the API key after this talk. <laughs> well, this is the second talk with the same API key, so <laughs> this this is just fine. <laughs> uh, so let's uh, say that this is the core market key uh, API uh, configuration key, and we're just going to do yux rest here. So we can just do a get on a specific path. Uh, what was it? Listing slash latest. And um, just return the um, 
coin market cap response object that you have. So this kind of looks like how you write a REST service yeah, with the JXRS, right? This is only the interface. This 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 is not implemented. This is just the interface for that. That's kind of cool. So uh, listings, and uh, we had some query parameters. So let's uh, do that with JXRS. So query parameters. We had a start, I believe. That's an integer. And we have another query param, which is the limits, uh, which is also an integer. And we had another query param, which was convert, converts, which is a string. Uh, You're missing the n in com. Converts, yeah. Cool. I would so. like to see you silently fill the demo, but well, I'm going to help you a little. <laughs> Well, probably going to fail the demo because I always forget some annotation somewhere. So this is our REST client. Uh, only thing was, uh, there was a little uh, header that you need to send uh, because it will need to know the, uh, the API. So we're going to add a header. So we're going to uh, register the client headers and this will be a coin market cap uh, header factory three or something like this dot class and we're gonna create this class this class needs to be application scoped just like uh, what you have in spring uh, maybe can you use application scope in spring i don't know yes i think i think you can but i, I never use it because i don't need to no you have service annotations right yeah, yeah. so this uh, uh gonna return a multi-valid map so we're gonna add it uh, and we have the uh, Coin market cap API header. API. This was the uh, the header that you need to send, and we need to fill it with the API key. It's just not a string, but it's a parameter. So this is basically what I did in in line in my client. You're doing this in a separate factory class. Yeah. So we're gonna have a spring API key uh, and uh, with spring you could just uh, add value here so let's uh, let's call this a configuration property and what is that configuration property uh, well, this is this one and we can just inject that here and we have one problem uh, that's uh, the unit test that's uh, gonna fill that's what we're gonna fill in later say bye to the unit test um this is a value of course uh, a name sorry this should work why does it work <laughs> uh config property name hmm this is annoying Ooh, i don't know yeah this is this is easy in spring yeah, this, this should be easy in the work. So I don't know what's this complaining about. Let's. Uh... Yes, this this is not the correct config property. So this is annoying. Ah, there we have it. So we need to have the uh, micro profile config property uh, in here. So, From Javi, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. So now we have our uh, nice little. Uh, REST clients, so let's uh, create the, uh, the service here. So let's uh, actually call it, call it crypto service, cryptocurrency service. And let's create a, uh, let's inject it. Uh, let's first inject the uh, REST client because we're just gonna use this. So we have the coin market REST clients. Uh, and I saw you do uh, some constructor injection. Yeah. So we can do that here as well. So can we create a constructor for that? Uh, but we need to tell it to inject a REST client because otherwise it starts to search for a uh, just a normal bean and it can't find it. So this is a REST client. So it's a little annotation that we need to uh, to do here. So this is how you instruct it to to uh, construct a REST client based on the interface definition yeah absolutely 
So let's create a find all function. Uh, let's import a normalist and call just call the uh, rest clients with listings. Start with one, return 500, and we're here in the, in the Netherlands, so we're paying with euros. Just going to return this, but this is going to return the uh, data of the data object. So we need to have data in here. Uh, so this is the response object, and I'm just going to return the data object and just ignore the other stuff uh, that was in there. And instead of the empty list, I want to return the actual uh, risk call. So I'm going to do just something else. I can do, always do inject. So let's inject the cryptocurrency service. And now return the service dot uh, find all. And this is no longer an object. This is now a cryptocurrency. And let's see uh, what it does now. Ooh. It can't find the service. So what did I do wrong? The service is, of course, a being. So that should be application scoped. So let's retry this. So wait, so you, you fixed something, and then you refreshed, and then and it's, it's there. Yeah, so I broke something. I fixed it. And now it just keeps on running, so there's no no issue there. So how about restarting your application? Why should I? It's still running. <laughs> it makes sense. So what did it do? It's returned a empty. This is schema, right? That we're seeing now. Oh, well, this is schema. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's it says it can't find it, so that's really annoying. Let's execute this. And I can't find it. So you got a four four, right? So is the uh, is the mm, the rest URL correct? What did we put on the uh, on the resource? Ah, uh, wait a minute. That could be it because if the coin market API. No, I meant in the greeting resource. What's the the the, the URI for the uh, rest for the rest API? Is it slash all? It's slash all. Yeah. So oh, slash, yeah, okay, slash, yeah. slash all will call the service, and yeah. service will call the rest client. But yeah. if the coin market cap uh, API uh, uh, returns a 404, you return yeah. a 404. So oh, yeah, that, yeah. That, that error is propagated to our application. Yeah. So probably made a typo here. Uh, let's try and find it. Listings, that latest. Oh, great. Let's try it again. And uh, well, there we, we have, have a nice it. bunch of Java objects. Yeah, that's nice. So that's the, the REST client. So what's next? Do, do we need to, to, to transform these Java objects to JSON? Because we are now we're not returning JSON yet, right? No, we're not returning JSON. That's uh, returning text plane. Returning text plane. So let's let's fix that. So it's easy as returning the Middle type, and now we have uh, again a four. Not, ac oh, not acceptable. Interesting. Not, not acceptable because uh, what, what's happening here is that Swagger uh, will call the API and will call the API with the accept header of text. Ah, yeah. We're trying to return text, but well, that's no longer there. So change the media type to JSON. Let's write out. Uh, Takes a while, which is a good sign. Yeah, yes, because actually, there we are. yeah, great. So what's next? So we now know that Bitcoin is still the number one cryptocurrency according to CoinMarketCap. Yeah, behind Ethereum. So that's kind of cool. So this is a REST client. So what else did we get? What do you got? Databases. Oh, we need to first right. see who won. Uh, I think the REST client was, was, was pretty nice and clean, what you showed uh, there. So the, um, yeah. it was only like an interface that you need to implement. Yeah, which was just JAX REST, so yeah. that's stuff you already know because that was also what you're going to need when creating REST services. So uh, actually, you can share those interfaces. You can implement your interface if you're going to create the service itself yeah. uh, and then uh, share the interface with your consumers and they will have immediately a REST client that they can use. So that's kind of cool. And I don't have to write any Java code. No, so I think it was fairly uh, clean. It was a, a little less code than, than I had. Uh, the, the construction of the headers was the same. So 
I'm going going to give this one with a with a just one minor win to Quarkus. Yeah. But I'll be I'll be coming back strong in the next uh, chapter. Yeah, let's try that. So we're going to need to talk to um, uh, to a database. So uh, this is the service. So the service basically ties the REST controller to our REST client and to our repository. So uh, the service has a find all method that will delegate to the repository to return everything in the database. It has a clear method which will clear the database. It has a replace all which will basically clear the database and then um, um, uh, get uh, put put a, the new list of cryptocurrencies in the database. And we have a call to um, uh, update uh, all the data from Coin Market uh, Market Cap and a find call to find find um, one symbol in the database. So basically, it's just delegating to the REST client and to the service. So the uh, repository is. Well, it couldn't be any sh shorter, right? So we only extend the JPA repository and we're saying, well, we're basically going to uh, get the cryptocurrencies and the ID is along and we only um, uh, put one interface method in here and then we're done. So could it be any shorter than this, uh, Yago? Let's try. So what Quarkus has is uh, not a repository layer, but it has uh, Pinash, which is a, a Hibernate framework. Uh, especially built for Quarkus, I believe, because I haven't seen it anywhere else, uh, which can uh, uh, make objects into uh, repositories. So let's show that. So first, le let's start with the, uh, the default entity. And this was a ID, right? So it now looks the same as you had in, in Spring. Yep. But instead of a creating repository, we can extend the entity class itself with a uh, pinash. 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 Uh, entity base and now we have our repository layer so let's uh, <laughs> wait so so okay i had an entity and and a one-line repository you're going for even less yeah i have two words i need to extend something and well a pinash entity base so let's try and use that so first off we have a uh, find all so let's create a public uh, void update or something uh, which is going to take the data from the REST clients, and uh, let's put it in a, uh, a variable. And now we want to save the cryptocurrencies. So cryptocurrency dots, because that's, this is our repository, we can now say um, persist all. Persist and uh, give it the, uh, the list. Okay, so it's a static call, uh, right? This is a static call to uh, to our repository. So it's using the entity manager of uh, Hibernate, and uh, we'll just uh, it will just work. Okay. So uh, before we need to insert all the the the, the cryptocurrencies in our database, uh, as it is an update call, we're just gonna clear up clear everything out. So we're gonna just uh, delete all. Uh, first, so there's also a, a convenience method that you uh, get. It's the same thing with the, uh, with the Spring uh, repository, right? And of course, we can also do a, a find all. And this find result we want to have in a list. And we're done. Uh, but of course, we want to have a clear function so we can see uh, this all works. So, cryptocurrency dot little and let's make this uh, a bit nicer so we have a clear we have an update and we have a find all i know people are going to be itchy watching the screen while you don't fix the and thank you <laughs> thanks on behalf of everybody who was itchy <laughs> with uh, ocd yeah <laughs> <laughs> so let's uh, create a uh, getter for the uh, update function and let's also create a getter for the, uh, the clear function. Uh, and now, if we call this again, first off, if we refresh this, uh, we have multiple methods here. We have the all clear and update. And if I call up all, uh, there should be an empty database. That's cool. So when we call updates, well, it just... We get an error? We get an error. Nice. Why, did we, why did we get an error? Because, uh, well, we can actually see the error. There was a transaction required. And this is the annotation that I always forget. In the service, the service is, is application scoped, but doesn't have a transaction bound to it. So this needs to be transactional. 
Uh, there was probably other in there automatically in some of the annotations I used in my app, I guess. Yeah, you used service, yeah. which is a wrapper for application scope with a transactional yeah. and maybe even more, but now we know exactly what's, uh, what's going on. Uh, so we updated it, uh, and so we can just do now the all, and now we get the stuff from the database instead of the actual REST client. Nice. So this was it, right? Yep. This is what you built. Now we have it in, in Quarkus. So what do you think about repositories then? It was it was nice, short, and concise. I'd say uh, it was. Well, <laughs> I thought you couldn't go any shorter than I did, but you, but you did. You you didn't even need a repository. No. I do have my doubts about the static call to Panache. It is nice and short, but what if I want to replace it with somebody else? Uh, I don't know. I, I, uh, it, it feels a bit uh, weird to do this in a static call. How, how yeah. do you feel about this? Uh, I feel the same. It's, it's a little bit awkward at first, but well, you get used to it. Uh, <laughs> but well, <laughs> everything. Uh, uh, will work out <laughs> You're saying it's a bit like Rivella. It, it tastes a bit yeah. weird, but it is good. Yeah, eventually. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I don't, yeah, I don't know. So, uh, it, it, I'd say it's either a tie or maybe a small win for Quarkus if you can can get over the, the, the itches you get from the static calls. Yeah, if you like the static calls, well, uh, then, uh, then Pinage is, uh, is your place to go. Otherwise, you can always implement your own repositories uh, with just the plain old uh, Hibernate, but uh, there is no repository templating uh, like Spring. So that's, uh, well, this is what you get. So what's the next round? What's the next round? Testing! Yes, testing. Testing is awesome with Spring. So in this case, I'm using uh, at Spring Boot test, uh, where my environment gets gets basically spun up automatically, and I can make service calls that will use an in-memory database um, to basically uh, test my database interaction. So it's a nice way to have some, like embedded integration testing. And you can also do integration testing where you do, where you spin up your Spring container, and you can automatically call the um, a REST endpoints that then uh, where you verify that your container is working, that also work against the database in memory. So I'd say that this is fairly well uh, doable uh, and, and the, the developer experience is pretty good here. Um, so, so how does it look in Quarkus? I'd no, well, say <laughs> not that much different, right? No, there is quite literally no, not much different. It's actually the same thing. It's just spins up a container, it injects stuff. Uh, you can also inject mocks if you want, uh, but it just behaves the same as uh, as a Spring Boot uh, container. So, so I don't think that there is a winner here. It's, it's, it's a tie. It's a I'd tie. Say, yeah. So, am I going to win the next one? I don't know. But I do have something nice to show you. Uh, we have a little bit of time. Oh, very little bit. Um, so let's go. Exit presentation mode uh, for seconds uh, because I need to copy paste uh, the the test that I removed uh, uh, a little while ago. So let's get that back and have this back. So we now have a cryptocurrency test. Uh, let's zoom in. That's the same thing we saw in uh, in our uh, uh, in our uh, in our demo. So if you go back to the Quarkus terminal, we see a test paused here. Uh, so what we can do is resume the test. It will start up the testing and it will find no test because I copy pasted this uh, outside of the IntelliJ context. IntelliJ uh, didn't see it. So if I uh, break the test, for example, I actually change something. You see that it's uh, running one of the two tests and one test failed. So now the unit testing are part of the normal developer experience. So if I fix this test, uh, the test will run and I can see the, what actually uh, happened with the testing. So running unit testing uh, is now part of the developer experience inside of the console. Uh, Quarkus will also try to find the tests that are uh, affected by your code changes. So uh, running the test only that you, if you change some tests, then it will run the, that test file. Uh, and if you change some code, then it will try to figure out which tests uh, have been run and uh, run it that way. So you don't have to run every single test. Uh, so that's kind of cool. So does Spring has such a feature? I'm not aware, but I think most IDEs can do some way of continuous test running as well. Yeah. I'm more of a person who changes some code, presses a shortcut to run the tests, and it writes like this. This this saves you pressing uh, pressing a shortcut. 
uh, I need to give it to you. Yeah, and figuring out which kind of tests, because if you have multiple sure. tests uh, hitting the same piece of code, then... Well. Yeah, because this, this is smart in a way where it only runs the tests that are, um, um, well, basically concerned with the change you made, right? Yeah, correct. Yeah. Yeah, so I would typically have, I don't know, probably one class, one test per class that I'm editing, and then yeah. we're running this test. So I'd say the workflow is kind of the same. This is a, a bit smarter. Yeah, it's a kind of cool, cool feature, but it's, well, it's, it's kind of a gimmick. So, what you saw uh, today was that I started the application only once. Uh, I didn't uh, restart the application. So what Quarkus has out of the box is uh, hot reloading. So the entire context of the application uh, will remain and only the code uh, is swapped out and hot replaced. So as you can see here, the hot replacement time was a half a second. And if we uh, see a boot up time of the application, that was around uh, two, uh, two seconds. So the hot reloading is a lot faster than starting up the application because it doesn't have to do a lot of checks. Uh, it can bypass a lot of stuff uh, and only replace uh, the stuff that uh, uh, well, actually makes sense to replace. That's kind of cool. So Spring. We have this in Spring as well, right? Yeah. So the, okay, the app maybe starts a little smaller, but it could have been just like, I don't know, maybe I was mining Bitcoins on my machine when I created yeah. this screenshot, uh, right? It's a difference of, I think yours was also starting in like three seconds or something, right? Yeah, it's, it's quite, quite similar. Spring yeah. Boot is a little bit, uh, it is a little bit slower, but not that much. And in yeah. some cases, it's even faster, so. So, okay, three seconds. So uh, obviously uh, in Spring, it, auto reloading is also built in. If you select the Spring Developer Tools, then you get this uh, for free. Once you build your product, uh, pro project, it also auto reloads. And this takes, well, about a second which is maybe a bit slower than it was in your case. but your case, it was half a second, yeah. right? So I'd say that these are fairly comparable uh, as well. So who wins here? I'd say it's a tie, unless if you're really impatient, then this half second might help. On the other hand, you, Quarkus is twice as fast, so. Yeah. It's, uh, I think, in, and also Quarkus has a little bit better understanding of what's gonna happen. Uh, it also does the reloading on uh, configuration chains and that kind of stuff, and you need to co configure Spring uh, to make that happen. But yeah, I did it, notice it, when I was testing this in, in, in uh, IntelliJ that I did need to run a, a build of the project so that the class, uh, basically the compiled class has changed. Yeah. It wasn't automatically reloading once I saved the file, but it could be my setup as well. So, so, okay, so. Ah, so we're already there, right? So yeah. I think we need to pick the final winner. Did Quarkus win or did Spring uh, win? I say that we were pretty close, and I'd say that most of the concepts are not that far from each other. Uh, let's like let's ask a random attendee here in the room, Sander. What would you use for uh, uh, for your company? Would you go for Spring Boot or Quarkus? I say Spring Boot, but not on technical matters. <laughs> Sander is going for Spring Boot, uh, but not on technical matters. So, okay. Uh, obviously, I'd say they're they're pretty comparable. Yeah, absolutely. And if you're used to Spring, then I'd say it's fairly doable to switch to Quarkus, uh, right? You ju you just showed it. Uh, I, I'm still uh, kind of a, like a Spring fan because that's what I know, but I think the Quarkus is, is a fairly worthy competitor, competitor as of now. Yeah, especially if you have a uh, a company where you have a lot of code that's already written in, in Java EE, uh, then a lot of those codes you can just port to Quarkus uh, with not much that uh, uh, difficulty, uh, especially if you use CDI, for example, uh, instead of the uh, EGB uh, annotations. Uh, so the migration path from uh, a traditional enterprise application to Quarkus to a microservice is uh, a lot smaller than uh, if you would uh, migrate your application to Spring Boot because probably you're going to start over again or no. well, not copy paste that much of code. So I guess it's uh, time uh, to go for questions from the audience, uh, right? Yeah. What questions do we have? Yes, well, first of all, uh, thank you, of course, for this, uh, let's say, uh, a refreshing kind of presentation. My, my opinion, opinion, I do think that we have to take into account a small penalty for Quarkus for having too many development errors during the demo. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll approve that. Um, you watching, of course, please uh, please type your questions in the in the chat. And uh, we do actually already have some questions. Um, the first one is: Does Quarkus have anything similar to the type of operation? Uh, type conversion. You have to help me here because I'm not a Spring developer, so maybe a virtual <laughs> can explain me what type. Uh, uh, I'm not really sure what is being meant with the type configuration classes. No typed. Typed. So, so you mean at configuration? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so well, yeah. In, in Spring, obviously, you can um, 
build your own configuration classes to override, I don't know, selecting beans and specific behavior. Yeah. Is there like a, a config comparable way in, uh, in Quarkus with creating, I don't know, uh, annotation based configuration classes? Yeah, absolutely. There is some similar, uh, some similar uh, mechanism in, in place. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, okay. the, the next, next one is about the, the, um, the testing. So, uh, there was this round with the database calls where uh, it's a bit itchy uh, with the database, the static call, but how would you test this? So the, with Panache, um uh, Actually, the, uh, the unit test that I showed uh, was uh, actually calling the database. Um, if uh, you don't configure anything, it will uh, take your production uh, properties and will use that in, in test. So that's really a bad idea. Uh, that's why you can also say uh, configuration properties are only for development. So if you start the application and you have development properties uh, enabled, then it will use that. And in test, you have different properties. So you will probably load up a H2 database uh, and um, uh, use that for your unit testing. Uh, and that's actually something that comes out of the box. Uh, well, we have to uh, include the H2, H2 uh, dependency, of course. Uh, but Quarkus will happily spin up a H2 container for you and, uh, well, uh, load up the schema from Hibernate, or uh, if you have Likibase or Flybay, or for example, you can use that to populate your database and well, just use it and uh, test your database calls and your queries if you want. I kind of like how this question somewhat explains my itch with the, the static calls, right? On the other hand, what are you going to test in a unit test with your database interaction? Uh, in my, my integration test, I was also spinning up an H2 container uh, connecting directly to the database. I do say I would say that you're a bit more flexible with selecting different implementations for what database you're going to if you if you're not doing any static calls. On the other hand, if you if you during your test can bring up an H2 database, then integration style testing will work as well, I'd say. So. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so, so I still, still think, think that, that because, because of course static, static calls are always a bit because of the, the, the mocking, mocking, let's say for example. Um so uh if you want to use, uh, for example, Mokito to uh, mock out your repository, uh, that's a good question. Um, usually what we did is hide those static calls behind an interface and mock that, but <laughs> that's a bit of cheating yeah. because usually we do uh, a lot more that uh, Pinash uh, can't handle. So it's, it's Pinash is, is fun for the base stuff. Uh, you can get a lot of uh, functionality out of the box, uh, but if it's, uh, complex queries, then well, you need to go back to Hibernate and well. Uh. I guess that nothing stops you from solving this problem by adding another layer of indirection, right? Yeah. You can make a repository class uh, that you instantiate and inject and then make this repository class call the static methods in the uh, f from the uh, repository. They could still, out still swap out the repository class for a stun double. Okay, so that would require, I would say that might a, a little bit more, uh, more code, yeah. Yeah. Luckily, of course, Mokito actually does have functionality for static functionality. Uh, static recent yeah, but every time you do that, you do this, a puppy gets killed, you know. So. <laughs> that is true, though it's nicely scoped. But, um, <laughs> only one puppy. By only one puppy. <laughs> yeah, only one puppy. So, um, how does, uh, another one, is uh, how does Quarkus determine which range this, uh, yeah, let's say, neat feature? Yeah. Um, by static analysis, or does it actually be instrument the code uh, it actually tries to instrument uh, some code so it's a uh, quite a new feature it's uh, released in quarkus 2 that's been released maybe last month or so um, so they are still develop developing it uh, but it does some code analysis of some uh, some instrumentation based uh, yeah, guessing what's what kind of test you want to run uh, when your code changes okay um uh, not, not related, related to this, this but um, this, this is about, about the knowledge and the community. So uh, somebody already mentioned that uh, on Stack Overflow, the hits and Google, the hits for Spring are going to the millions. But if you start looking for Quarkus, it's uh, in the thousands. Um, does this cause any problems or potential issues? Not yet. Um, I've been using Quarkus now for over a half a year in, uh, in actual uh, my day to day job. Uh, and everything that I wanted to look up, I could find on online. So uh, the questions that are relevant are being asked and well, there is actually a community growing. If you asked me these questions two years ago when Quarkus started, uh, then I would definitely say that, that it was still growing and still starting and uh, well, but it's it's catching up with, with, with Spring. Spring has a huge 
uh, leap ahead of, of Marcus. So uh, it will take some time to catch up or uh, even uh, well, get close to, uh, to spring. But uh, well, the community is growing and uh, well, uh, it's, it's used more and more uh, in the, the big companies that are using uh, enterprise applications. Uh, which run on uh, JBoss or WebSphere or WebLogic or whatever application server, uh, which want to migrate to microservices. And well, this is the then obvious choice to uh, to use that. Okay. Um, we have another question regarding uh, Spring versus uh, Quarkus. Uh, does Quarkus offer fine-grained control over bean context con creation, like context configuration in Spring? Um. Do they mean like startups things or? I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't use this much also in, in the Spring world. Yeah. Uh, what's being used in, in Quark is a CDI. Uh, it's a little bit uh, less of, uh, of the CDI spec than uh, the, the full CGI spec. But a lot of features that you're probably going to use, like post construct or uh, pre construct and that kind of stuff, uh, is available there. And also, uh, uh, application hooks for application startup and application shutdown, that, that kind of stuff is already is, is there and you can use it. Uh, it's, a, it's a limited subset of the full CGI implementation, but it's, it's very well usable and it's well. It's, uh, no. yeah, so um, actually, I got the second. Uh, um, it's, it's about, about the context, context of testing. So, so there, there apparently you can. can. Oh, you can like say this, this bean is only used in a test context and this is used in a production context. Yeah, yeah you can uh, configure it uh, uh, with a test property and you can say, uh, for example, an alternative for a specific bean. So, yeah. It's... Okay. Um, I don't see any more questions, but uh, I think you both left your Twitter handles in the slides. So, again, uh, they can reach out to you. Absolutely. Um, I think. That's at least it for this presentation. So I want to uh, say again, uh, uh, thank you for uh, for this nice presentation. So everybody can give another small round of applause uh, behind their keyboards. Yeah. And let us know in the chat who you think won. Did you think Spring, Spring win or did you think that Quarkus won? Yeah. Based on the amount of questions, I at least know which is the best understandable <laughs> and also which raises the most amount of questions. So we'll see for yeah. ourselves. Yeah, and if you want to see the, the actual source code, it's, uh, it's on screen. Uh, you can uh, check that out. And, uh, well. Uh, have play with it yourself. Yes. Oh, thanks. Um, yeah, to all viewers at home, thank you for watching. We'll be back uh, not next month, so we won't have a meetup in August, but we will be back in September with a new meetup. Um, yeah, so until um, so then, don't forget to subscribe. Click the notification icon so you'll be notified of the next call, and uh, that will be it. Thanks. <laughs> thanks.